from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Okay, so we are ready. Today's oh, wait a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Oh no, it's fine. Okay, we're okay. Okay. Today is Wednesday, May twenty sixth, two thousand eleven. <clears throat> My name is Joe Munier of the. <clears throat> excuse me, Southern Oral History Program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, I am in Austin, Texas with our videographer for the project, Mr. John Bishop, uh, and we are here to interview Mr. James Oscar Jones for the uh, joint project uh, being conducted by the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian, and more particularly the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American and History, African American History and Culture, excuse me, the new uh, Civil Rights History Project, a national uh, civil rights oral history series. Mr. Jones, good to be with you. Thanks Thank so you. much for sitting down. Thank with you. Us. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned before, we, we we turned on the camera today. I, I thought we'd start with um, just a sketch of your family history because I, I know it will have a lot to do with the course of your life. And so I'd love to hear about where you were born, where you came up, parents. Mm -hmm. Glad to. My parents, Ernest Jones, and uh, and mom, Pertis Jones. Dad, my father, born and raised on the farm. That was his life. That's what he loved to do. I'm a member of a family of 10 children, six boys and four girls. And the four, first five children was born as Routon because their dad was Routon and he was killed cutting logs in the wood. And so that first five were very young when he died. And then my dad, Ernest Jones, married my mama and has five more children. But my dad raised all 10 of us because they were very, very young when, when their dad got killed. And basically what he did was they were very disciplined uh, had a seventh grade education. Mom had a seventh grade education, but very bright, very uh, brilliant people. And one of the ambitions they had, and they gave us as we were little kids, he had two goals for us. He wanted all of us to be educated, and he wanted to see all 10 of us in heaven. And so he wanted us to be committed to church, hard work and school. So I had the pleasure of going to school all the way through elementary, all the way through high school, and I never missed a day. He was mean and tough on us going to school. So we had to get up four o'clock in the morning, milk the cows, feed the pigs, and do all of this, walk one mile from the house to the dirt road where the bus came by and catch the bus at 6.45. And you had to do that. That was your shore, that was your, t and it applied to everybody, the girls and boys the same way. So we had the fortune of understanding work very early and going to school very early. And that's kind of what dad shaped. He said he was, when he bought his first acre of land he was 13 years old. He paid $1.25. It took him six months to make that $1.25. So the farm we grew up on were part of Frank McKinnon, which is um, Jimette McKinnon, which is my mama's side. But then he added to the acreage and, and, and grew us a good, good farm where we farmed cotton, corn. And then we had, because he couldn't borrow any money, from Farmers Home Administration those days, he created um, a large piece of the farm and we had peach orchards and berries and all of that. And the cash money we made from the sale of the fruit and vegetable is what money he used to farm the uh, cotton corn and with, so. How big was, uh, and what was the nature of Louisville in those days? Well, when I was a little boy, there was a lot of folks there. Uh, it, uh, it it's never has been an incorporated town. It's just a village. 
I would say when I grew up, two or three hundred kids maybe. And what happened is most of the kids grew up with me, uh, migrated and took off, went to Detroit, Dallas, Texas, Houston, Texas, all those places looking for work. We were the only farm, black farm group in Willisville with a farm. All the other kids were worked on farms, but they were not theirs, primarily white farmers. And, and that was hard because they weren't allowed to go to school. They came to school maybe after Thanksgiving, but by March it was time to start tilling the soil again. They had to come back to work. So a lot of them didn't have an opportunity I had to go to school from grade one through high school. Yeah. How'd, you, how'd your father manage the farm <clears throat> without all that extra help that would have been there if he hadn't sent you every day to school? Well, what, what, um, what he did was all of us was big enough to do some from uh, older sisters and brothers, but also he always used, and it, there were some of the older kids who dropped out of school and just kind of wondered, and he would go get those kids and bring them back and they, they would work there with us. And, and he would pay them at the end of the day or at the end of the week. They were excited about that because when they worked on the other farms that they didn't own, a lot of time they were put on the books. And the problem with that system was they never made enough money. They never worked hard enough to pay off those debts. So you were always, and then dad would have them to come over in September when the state fair was taking place. And he would say, come on over here late in the evening and I'll give you a little work so you have a few bucks to go to the fair. You know, and everybody wanted to go to the fair, and, but they didn't have any money, so that's how Dad helped out. And then they was gracious to come over and, and work at our place as well. Were your parents, um, tell me about church, and were they, were they active in the NAACP? My, my mama was very active. Dad stayed very close to the farm you know, day in, day out. Uh, but uh, Sunday was a day you couldn't touch the farm. I mean, that was a day you had no choice but to get up and down the dirt road and fighting the dust going to church. All day long, church. <laughs> not, not one service like the city folk got at 8 o'clock or 12 o'clock. No, you went to church in the morning, and when you got out of that church, you went to another church because my mom had a, beautiful singing voice, and everybody in the little neighborhood wanted her to come sing. We'd hop in the back of the truck and go to that place, and then somebody had a five o'clock meeting, we'd go to that church. So it was church, 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 church. <laughs> so, oh yeah, I had plenty of church. <laughs> tell, me, tell me about their, their, you know, their sense of politics and race relations. And... My mama, we, everybody called my mother Vic. Matter of fact, when she passed away, and they had the name Purtis Jones. And a lot of folks called the funeral home in Magnolia, said, who is this Purtis Jones? So the undertaker said, well, everybody know her as Vic. And when he said that, people from all over the country had left and went to Milwaukee and said, uh-uh, y'all cannot have that funeral. Postpone that funeral because we want to come home to that funeral. And that's when the word got out, it was Vic. So hundreds and hundreds of people came in. But Mama on, she was very active in organizations, in WCP, in Magnolia, that was the closest place. She would go to those meetings, and when she would come back, she would talk to kids at church. Now, we got to do some things. They, they talked about in that meeting how we can do better, how, we, how folk need to learn how to fix up their own homes and all that and stop depending on outside people. And, and then she would, when they would have those meetings, she and her sister would throw people in the back of the old pickup truck and they were gone. And, and it was not a thing where she would go ask parents permission. She would just get in that old truck and just go through and get in, get in this truck, get in this truck. And they would go to the meetings. So the kids, you know, growing up in a rural area, they were glad to jump in the back of the truck and go somewhere, you know. So uh, 
she, and she, and that, that was her. She was just very active all over the place. And, and, um, and when she learned about what people were doing, she would come back to church and talk to church people about what we need to do is we need to get the, the men together to do this and, and the women get together because that's the kind of uh, thing she would learn from the NWCP meeting. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember, um, <clears throat> say, let, let's think of a few things through the 50s and, uh, you know, from Brown v. Board to mm -hmm. Montgomery to Little Rock, mm -hmm. especially Little Rock, given where we are, where you were. Um, is it, were those things talked a lot about in the house? Or mm. Church, it, it one, through your life is what I'm The thinking. one thing I remember was in uh, the Brown, uh, the Brown case. Third Good Marshall and my dad always, he had this big old radio, huge radio, and it was very powerful. Matter of fact, in Willisville, Arkansas, we could pick up St. Louis, and that's how we kept up with baseball. All we had the radio on. And, and Mr. Third Gill made a statement and it was on the radio. He wanted every Negro in America to stand still that one day at noon because the. I'm sorry. Okay, we're back. Uh, Ms. Jones, uh, we just had a brief pause to check the camera. Um, you had just started talking about Brown, and, and you were saying an important thing about your dad and, uh, in relation to Third Marshall. Mm. They were so um, amazed by that, and, and Mr. Thurgood put out a, on radio that on that day, 12 noon, he said all Negroes should stand still at 12 noon because of uh, the Supreme Court is fixing to make an announcement. And that announcement and that Supreme Court are gonna change this whole nation. So daddy, you know, said, and he went to the little school, Sweet Home, where I was going to school. He went down there and told the teachers about it and said that we need to make sure everybody hear what uh, is about to be said. So he had that much politics in his head. And people got, got those radios and, and really was listening for that, for that, that announcement. So he, he, he stayed on top of stuff uh, the same way. He, and he was that same way about farming. He could not borrow money from Farmers Home Administration. But what he would do is that he kept his eyes very close on what white farmers were doing. And some of the, the wealthier white farmers would um, use the plows and they would break a plow and they had the ability to go and to get money and get a new one. And what he did was he would ask those black guys that were working for those, those white owners, he said, what are they gonna do with that plow? Oh, nothing, we've already gone and got it. He said, um, I want to see if I can get that plow. So they were going to say, Mr. Womack, um, Ernest want that plow. He's going to have his broke. And he would take it up to, because the little school we went to, a vocational school, and the kids would experiment with um, welding that back. And so we, we would use those plows. So that was, uh, those were accumulation that he didn't have to pay for as part of his farming. So he was, he was on top of the farming as well as um, uh, the political side of the yeah. thing, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the fact that your father owned his own farm, how much did that matter in two ways? One, in relation to other members of the black community locally, mm -hmm. and in relation to um, maybe how your life unfolded in, uh, in a sense of how you measured your own possibilities and independence. Mm -hmm. The first part on the, um, the farm side, what mom and dad did, people who lived on other farms and they had very poor houses, he knew that 
if we did any kind of work on those houses, they would get tossed off the farm. And what he would do, he would have us to go and help them to crack the house and all that kind of stuff. We would go cut wood and put it on the inside to seal the, to seal the, 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 the holes and everything. And that was no cost. And that was something we, his son, we had to do it. And when, and if we, I remember the one time my brother under me, he took a quarter from this little lady and says, y'all do so much and we're just so thankful. Here, y'all take this quarter. I told Chester, no, I don't take no money. You know, Dad, I don't, I don't, no, we, this is something he want us to do for folks. And we went home and Dad would say, did you boys take any money? I said, no, sir. I said, Chester did. He said, well, how much money, uh, I don't remember her name. He said, gave him a quarter, give me that quarter. And so he took the quarter and we went to church Sunday. <laughs> he made Chester take that quarter up to the, the pulpit and put it in the offering. He could not spend it. <laughs> so, and, and, and we did that for a lot of elderly people. And, and so he was just that kind of caring. On the, on the other side, I was being kind of trained to do something pretty good, but I didn't see it because dad and mama would go to the school and would have all these talks with the, with the teachers. And what they was talking about later on, I learned from my older sisters and brothers is that they said, James, dad and, and Mom is very proud of you, you're real smart, and they'll tell those teachers to push you, push you real hard because you got the smarts. And, but I, I, I learned that a little later because I noticed I always have to do everything at school, everything. We have a little school program. No, we want you to be the, the MC. We want you to um, start that group. We want you to be over the agriculture program. And I had all these assignments. And so when I would come home, um, I didn't get a chance to go out and play because I had to do all these things and they would come, now, now, now James, you got to get all that stuff done. So between feeding the hogs and the chicken and all that and doing that, by that time it's dark. And I also played basketball on the basketball team, but I didn't see anything in that. But when I got a little further in uh, school toward the 11th grade, I could see it. Um, we want you to do some marvelous things, James, and, and you got the skill, you're smart, you do good work in school, you go in place. So that's when they started uh, encouraging me. And then when that happened, uh, I was playing basketball, and this was a real shock to me, because, you know, we worked hard, but Dad didn't give you no money. And we would always ask Dad, Dad, why do you other kids come work on a farm. Why do you pay them, but you don't pay us? He said, that's because I'm saving for hard time. <laughs> so my sister Clara said, well, Dad, it's pretty hard. <laughs> he said, no, you don't even know what hard time is. You got a place to stay. You got clothes. No, you t you're teaching us that you don't know what a hard time is. And then the guys way across what we call a creek, the bus didn't go over there, so they were basketball guy. They would come over to our house and stay with us, and the bus would come down this dirt road. And we were playing in this district uh, tournament, and Daddy came up to us, and he had like twenty-five dollars in in change and one-dollar bill. He said, "James, take this and and." Uh, your boys got a little money to spend, and he said, and, and, and the girls buy them ice cream, like a nickel, and buy the girls some ice cream, and oh man, we were on cloud nine. So uh, when we got to the gym, and so I bought the girls the ice cream, and so the word was around, he's rich. <laughs> Oh, he's rich. He's rich. So, so a lot of the kids started calling me rich. I said, 
If I am, I don't know nothing about it. I, ain't, I don't see. I don't, you saw the same money I saw with it at that one ball game. So I, so he, it, it was a, he, he helped us and he took, he took me in and taught us to uh, <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that was, everybody was pushing me and pushing me, everybody was. Because the older Christian brother had helped me start the ball game. And now they went to school as they left, but that was after they left. And um, and but in my case, I stayed there. And and, and my older sisters and brother would um, write letters and say, "How you doing in school?" And send me your grades. And I would send them my grade. They would send me a dollar. And when you know, back in those days, a dollar, man, you was filthy rich. <laughs> yeah. I'm interested. We'll talk about everything that's going to happen at. at uh, in Pine Bluff, um, after you get there in '61, and especially in '63, mm -hmm. but I'm I'm curious if if um, how much the early '60s were, late '50s, early '60s, making an impact on you. Little Rock in '57, mm -hmm. sit-ins in Greensboro mm -hmm. in '60, all of what happened quickly mm -hmm. after that. Yeah. We, we the, the the one big favor, well not favor, but the one thing that prepared me really well for that is that because daddy and mama listened to the radio and they paid attention to that kind of stuff and they were really on top of Central High and um, and I remember one time um, mama said to me she said son if you ever didn't put it as a put in that situation, don't turn it down. You go forward with it. And that was a result of what I didn't realize was that my mama and my aunt and daddy, in the early days, they had buses come through a small town. And even in those days, they were the only black folks that would get on that bus on the front seat and take us with us. And then that kind of came back to me. I said, oh, we integrating the bus line. Because when Central High came through, it, it kind of, uh, and, 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 and those were her words, that whenever you get an opportunity to um, do something for other people, don't be afraid. Because you didn't, you didn't come from a, 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 an afraid. She said it was dangerous when y'all went to to wear your own cotton, the white people didn't like that. And, but y'all been through it and you've seen it and you can, when opportunity come, don't go to the back of the line, you go to the head of the line and, and be brave about it. Now they all, now they did talk about that. And um, when I went to, went off to school, you know, I had all that in my head, so it, it, it wasn't, I wasn't looking for anything, but when I saw, um, when I got to Pine Bluff in the city, you saw real, real segregation because it was a city in Willisville. You were down to Woo in the Woods, and when you go to town, you would see it. But when I got there, I really saw it. But I wasn't organized or nothing, but, but, I, but I saw it as I went downtown, and I saw the, the Holiday Inns and all of those. And, I looked at them and I saw, only thing I saw black folks was they were maids. So that registered in, in my mind. Yeah. So, and when I went back home, I, I shared that with them. Yeah. He said, uh, well, son, if you, I'm not gonna tell you what to do, that's what my mama said to me. If you um, go somewhere and y'all like, because we would travel some time in, in the, with the football, you know, the, the, the sports. Don't you never go through a uh, back door. If whites go through the back front door, you go through the front door. Now, I heard that from her. Yeah. You oh. mentioned a moment ago um, that your family, you mentioned that, you know, you had gone and weighed your own cotton. Can you, can you tell that story just a little bit? Mm -hmm. that meant? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> Kids who lived on a plantation, they would work hard 
and you have these 10 and 12 foot long sacks. And when you picked that much cotton, you were hitting 60 pounds, 65, and some guy was really good and hit as much as 80. But when they brought their bags to the gin, white people didn't let them stay that and weigh their own cotton. So they would bring the bags and drop them and go back. Now, in my case, Daddy and Mama, Aunt Nun and Uncle Bluefoot went to the gin. Now, my Mama, Dad, and Uncle and Auntie were gun-packing black folks. They would sit right at the gin with them double barrel shotgun and two shell between their fingers. And when we got our cotton, come, come on boys, and they would go up there and weigh, we would weigh our own cotton. Now the kids who would bring that cotton to the uh, gin, they couldn't weigh theirs. And we would sit there and watch this. Sometime those bags would be 70 pounds of cotton. And these, these guys would ask each other, well, John, what'd you think? Oh, let me see. Oh, give or take 41 pounds. Oh, pretty good old boy. Give him benefit of 47 pounds. So that's 40 pounds they were taken away from him. So I would sit there and witness that. Now the fun kind of thing was, man, Clarely and Jess and all of us, you know, we felt pretty comfortable because Mama not knowing was there with those guns. And so when we weighed out cotton, we were looking at the white folks. <laughs> <laughs> How could your family get away with that? It was, you know, you know, everybody in Woodersville and the surrounding area believed that if they bothered my family, there was a whole lot of killing going to take place. Well, they believe that. Because my brother had been in a real bad racial situation. Troy, I got his number on that. He was the only black member that went to a little town called McNeil, and he got a job working on the railroad. railroad. He didn't, it wasn't, he wasn't on the train. He was doing the hard work, putting those spikes and all that to, to keep the well. And when he went wherever they went, and on the way back, when they got to McNeil, they told Troy he had to get off the train because he couldn't, blacks couldn't, uh, well, Negro wasn't the black folks name, it was Negroes in those days. Negroes couldn't ride the train through McNeil's little small town. And my brother Troy uh, wouldn't get off the train. And just like my parents, he had his weapon. And oh, it was a hard knockdown fight. You know, he stabbed and cut a whole bunch of white folks and then they chased him and shot him up pretty bad. But he got through the woods and all that. And so the white people decided that they were gonna come to our house and kill him. And Mr. Chester Waters, is is the guy who in Willisville had the little store, both the little stores there. He told the people, said, don't, don't y'all go over there. Y'all gonna get killed. And so my dad had some brothers, some cousin, and, and you had to go down through these woods, this dirt road, to get over to the farm. And about dark at night, they was coming in there to get Troy. Man, there was so much shooting and so many people got hit and and I heard them screaming, oh, I've been hit. And what daddy did and his brothers, when they were shooting people, they went to them and took their guns. They let them go, but they took all their guns. And so it was kind of known that the McKinnis wanted to, want the folks to mess with. <laughs> and it was a lot of them. It was a bunch of them. <laughs> I was 68. Oh, no, no, sorry, excuse me. How yeah. old were you then? Oh, eight, okay. nine. Matter of fact. So early 50s then. Yeah, I went up, uh, I went up to okay. Willisville and because Dad made the comment, said if, 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 uh, if, if 
they come down here and mess with me, I'm going to kick their ass. Those are the exact words. So I thought he was talking to me. And I went to Willisville like a, a mile and a half. So I walked all the way to Willisville and told this, told this white guy, Womack, what my dad had said, he kicked me. I went back home and told dad he kicked me. Dad said, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of that later because all this was in the making, preparing for this, yeah. That's, a, that's a extraordinary. Ooh, oh, yeah. Okay. Tell me what it was like to <laughs> impressions you, you, you formed when you arrived in Pine Bluff to go to school. And I'm thinking about, you, you mentioned already that you saw segregation in the mm -hmm. landscape of that city mm -hmm. in a way you hadn't mm -hmm. seen it before, mm -hmm. but also on the campus because that was, that was a very important black institution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I got there uh, to Pine Bluff, you know, that was my first big city. Uh, the campus was very pretty. It was, it was real exciting. And what helped me jumpstart real fast is that the school I went to, Oak Grove High School, was a very good school. And matter of fact, they had sent about four guys from that school with professors at Pine Bluff. And I didn't know that was before I came along, and my brother in Milwaukee sent me a letter and said, there is a guy in the vocational school. You go find him and tell him that Charlie one of my older brother, sent you. He was a Haney, Dr. Haney. And I went there, and when uh, I walked into his office, he looked up and he said, I don't know your name, but you sure one of them Joneses <laughs> from Ralston, Willisville. <laughs> and he recognized, oh yeah, you look just like Ernest Jones. And so I started talking and, and, and then he you know, really was telling me all about the school and walked around and took me all over the campus and said, this is one of my boys, Ernest Jones boys. Them boys are sweet, kind. I mean, he really just painted this beautiful picture. They are smart. And I want all of you professors to keep your eyes on him. He's a good student. Don't, don't, don't be putting him over in social studies. He's good math, algebra. He came from a high school that had all of that. Because when some guys asked me, he said, uh, one guy told me, I said, you might need to take preliminary courses. He said, you from a small town? I said, yeah. He said, well, what, what did you have in high school? I said, I had algebra, I had trigonometry, I had physics, I had biology, chemistry. <laughs> he said, man, what kind of school did you go to? I said, I had a school that was a um, very good school. As a matter of fact, uh, the um, principal imported, he handpicked teachers from all around to come in and, uh, at that school. It was was Oak Grove private? No, it, it was a school, but it was, um, there were four schools in Arkansas. And that was built way back in the 1931 by the, uh, I think they were, they were the, it's a group out of New York somewhere built the school way back, because I know our school was opened in 1829, and the school was built, and they had vision of, of folks coming because the school was built with dormitories. So these teachers came from other places, and they live right there on campus. I think the Quakers are uh, Quakers, uh, exactly. and, and there was two all-black school districts. Mine was one of them. And the other one was Arkansas City, where Ebony Magazine Johnson Man came out of. Mm -hmm. So we had, unlike a lot of other schools, we had books because we could float bonds and we had to, you know, the books not, because a lot of the white schools give their old books to the black schools, but no, we had good books and we had good teachers and things like that. So I had a good start. You're, you're describing a of personal history that isn't very typical mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. folks in that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It, was, it was good. Between, between, I'm sorry. 
So when I got to Pine Bluff, I was very comfortable and had met somebody that had been in Roston and then he took me around and then he introduced me to Dr. Marshall. And Dr. Marshall was a professor on campus and he had another little house right by his house. And he asked me, he said, well, you gonna live in a dormitory? I said, well, I gotta live somewhere. And, and Dr. Haynes said, put him in your house over there. And you, 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 are like, you, are like, you will take a liking to this, to this young man. And so we started talking and he said, you sure know a lot to be a country boy. He said, these country kids, come on, they don't know nothing. And, 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 you know, we think the city kids know everything. And so we just started talking and, and then he was the one told me, he said, there are some folks in Little Rock that's trying to get a civil rights thing started. And they went to Philander Smith and they didn't, they didn't have no, no, no luck there because all those kids were city kids and their parents said no, uh -uh, and they were gonna get put out of school and all of that. And he said, I want you to, I'd like for you to meet, meet, meet those guys. And that's when Greenwich, that's how I met Greenwich. And uh, when old Greenwich came down and um, Greenwich and Bill Hansen, and I hadn't met Worth, but a little bit later on I met him. And so uh, a few days later, uh, they, they, they both came and started talking. And uh, so, uh, so Bill Hansen said, dang, man, you've already done what we tried to do <laughs> down at your hometown. <laughs> and then when uh, uh, I said, well, you know, that, that's how my, I was raised. He said, man, this would be a piece of cake for you. But then they, uh, that wasn't when they were trying to get it started, but they said that they were working in Little Rock and doing some things. And, but when we come back to Pine Bluff, we need to sit down and talk because this is a college town and, and there's a lot of segregation here. And, and here, is, here you guys are down here. Y'all got all these McDonald's and all of this, and the black people can't go to it. And this, and this, is, and, and this city is driven by this, the university here. So, you know, so, so that's, and that, that's how I met them. Yeah. Do you remember more specifically about this group of folks, uh, Greenwich and Hanson, and one's black, one's white, they're SNCC people? Mm -hmm. It's probably the first you might have right. heard of Smith, right. maybe? When, when we met, uh, Greenwich talked about he had been involved in labor and union groups a lot. When Bill Hansen talked, he talked about he had been involved in sit-ins and things like that. And, but the first thing Bill Hansen said is, we need to organize some students to challenge. They had already been around and saw the McDonald's. I didn't even know what a McDonald's and all that was, <laughs> even though it's right down the street. And but Bill Hansen's take was, I'm a white boy and I don't need to be leading it. And, and that's what he said. But we need a, a black person and. You've already done all this stuff. And he said, uh, if you went into one of these white restaurants and was, a, and was arrested, what would uh, your parents say? They would come up here and they would come to the jailhouse and they would say, James, is this what you want to do? And if I said yes, he said, We'll do it. Whatever you need for us to support you, and they will go back home. <laughs> he said, "Really? <laughs> they wouldn't?" I said, "No, no," because I said because they talked to me long before I knew anything about this kind of stuff. About you know, if you get involved and stuff, and and they talk about, don't you ever go through no white doors, no back doors. You go through the front. If there's a front door and white people go, you go through it too. He said. Whoa, man, well, your mama's a civil rights worker. I said, well, I, don't, I, I guess not because I'm in Woodlandsville. There wasn't a whole lot to do, but I did tell them, I shared with them 
how mom and him rode the bus. And he said, yeah, that's civil rights stuff. I said, we, I didn't know it, about that. Just to me, that's how they were. And I remember uh, Brian Womack was the, what we considered the, 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 the rich white man there in Willisville. And as we got involved, as I got involved, he was talking to mom about, you need to go get that boy and he up there doing all of this and in the, in the black school and that's where you need to be and not running around, blah, blah, blah. And uh, <laughs> so mama got the word and, uh, and I wasn't home when this happened. They said mama went and jumped in the car with him, made him take her out to Waldo to buy some clothes for me and told him, said, I really ought to make you take these clothes to buy blood. <laughs> My sister said, and Mr. Womack was a big white guy. He said it was freezing cold. He was sweating. <laughs> he was sweating so bad because <laughs> he knew Mom had that pistol in her purse. <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, but no, no, that, 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 and I told him, no, no, but my mama wouldn't do that. And he said, because in, in Little Rock, that was the issue. Everybody was afraid that parent would take them out of school and do all this stuff, and that, that's why they couldn't get that started. So. Did you, early on, did you have any instinct that, uh, that what might actually end up being the problem, what did end up being one problem, would, would emerge, namely that, that the folks at the, at the college would, that your president would, no, you know, um, I I didn't think that side at all. Um, you know, I was I went and looked at the the hotel that was segregated, and and I went down there by myself the first time, just to walked check it out. Yeah, just to check it out. And um, when I came back, when they started talking about we need to protest these places. Um, I, so I, you know, I said, "Let me go talk to some. I'll go talk to some some students." And when I when I talked to them, I told them what my parents like. But I also said, "Now, if your parents is going to come up here and jump on you for doing it, don't go. Don't go." And then Mr. Uh, Dr. Doctor, her husband was a principal at a high school. And he told me that I, I went and met with him. He said, now I got some young high school student in my school, Towns, Townsend High School. The big high school there for most of the black were Merrill High. But this school was kind of getting started. He said, these kids, what you talking about doing, they need to get involved with a guy like you. He said, they're smart, but they want to be thugs. He said, oh, they're they real brave, and, and they want to be thugs. He said, but I think if, if they were around you, you would change them. I said, you think so? And uh, so I met with them and talked to them about, you know, my parents, what that was like. And they, and they like that. I said, now look, but now what we're talking about is going here and it may be very violent, but we're going to be a non-violent group. <laughs> so all the boys said, oh, hell no. <laughs> no, no. There's going to be some fight. And uh, said, oh, no, oh, no. I mean, they hit you in the face, knock you down, and you're just going to fall and get up. I said, yeah. He said, oh, no. <laughs> but, you know, so. Why do you think that was a good idea, the nonviolent thing? Well, the way I looked at it was if you can be nonviolent, the white people would be very happy to beat you down. They would be very happy doing that to you. But I felt, though, that in spite of that, you could overcome it over t 
time period. And I, and I felt that if I were beaten down and the other kids were scared and afraid of it, I think eventually they'll come, they'll come around. Like them kids I was talking about, they did. But, uh, and I just, and I think what helped me is I wasn't scared. I wasn't scared. Yeah. When the, I'm sorry. I, um, my knowledge wasn't good enough to uh, f feel that I definitely could win doing it right then. But I felt that I could, I could see in white people's faces that it was working because uh, I, I saw young white girls and young white boys come up and, and would hit me and stuff and run. And when I would look at them, I saw them crying. I saw them crying, but they wouldn't, didn't want folk to see them, but I saw them. I said, you know, they're doing something they don't want to be doing. So it, 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 uh, it, and, and I saw that. And when I told uh, uh, Gwyneth that, he said, for real? I said, yeah. Well, you know, they were told to come up and hit us, but that wasn't in their heart. And, and I saw it. I saw, yeah, we can, we can do this. At the end of the first day, February 1, 63, in Woolworths, were you, how'd you feel at the end of that day? That was a little scary because um, we sent, the first day we went to Woolworth, we tried to go there. It was locked or something. We couldn't get in. It was a closed renovation or something. And then, uh, what's her name? Diane. Diane came, was in town. Diane, Diane. What's Diane's last name? I understand she's still going strong. Diane, Diane, Diane. Anyway, she was an extremely light-skinned black girl, and she went down to Woolworth and, and went in and eat because they thought she was white. And when she came back, she said, no, it's open. And, and when we uh, went, went in, she said, she said, go in at, at 11 o'clock for, for some reason. I think that was a time, I guess a lot of people gonna be in there. So we pound in there and it was a massacre because uh, uh, Diane had been through the, the Freedom Rides and all that stuff. And her theory, her, her strategy was that if there's a lot of people in there, it wouldn't hurt very well because it, it wouldn't be enough room. And, uh, and then she said, if they start hitting you, fall to the floor. And when you fall to the floor to do all this, fall toward where the people were. So when we did that, all the white folks that was in there was also on the floor. <laughs> so, so you died off of that. They tried to get up. You scoot a little bit further. They fall. So it was. Kind of fun and a little bit scary, you know, but uh, that's how it went. But uh, Chancellor Chancellor Davis, before too many days. Oh, oh, that's to meet with you. Yeah, yep, yep, that that, that, that went well. Two things um, because we had a pretty good crowd, but that was short lived because Dr. Davis called us in, and then half of the parents came to Pine Bluff too. And they were snatching all them kids off. I think when they finished with Dr. Davis and the parents, three or four of us maybe was left. It was, it's, uh, I know I was there. Nash, uh, I think, let me see, Joanne stayed, the girl Joanne. Joanne now is, um, matter of fact, Joanne is, is a professor at uh, Pine Bluff at college, and I think she just retired. She stayed. Uh, what about who else? There was this tall guy from Texarkana. He stayed on. It was about four of us. About four of us. It, it, it was. And then we all went to see the president, and he was 
truth point blank. He told us the very next day, if anybody went downtown, was suspended. Now, the interesting thing about that now, that was kind of different. It was only about four or five of us who said was going. But when we went the next time, there were about 12 or 15 folks in the suspension. But they didn't come the first time. So it kind of grew a little bit there. And he, he put us all out. How did you, how'd you uh, make your decision to take that hit? Take the, the, take the expulsion? Well, I mean, you've, you've said a lot already that mm -hmm. creates a context for that, but that's still, that must have been not an easy thing. No, but um, in my case, in my case, folks, everybody asked me, what do your parents think? I said, my parents support what I'm doing. And the tall guy from Texarkana, he called his parents and talked to them. And they kind of let him along. Um, the guy that, this guy, this other guy, um, Nash, he was from Pine Bluff. He stayed there. And that was kind of like the, the voice of encouragement. And you know, they would sit there and listen to me and, and uh, what if we get hurt? I said, we are going to get hurt. Uh, but we, you know, we are like, a, this is like a war. And, and Woolworth, they attacked us, but there was no, no, no jail stuff there. And I said, eventually, we're going to have to go to jail if we continue to do this. So they were a little bit afraid of the jail. And then... We went back there two or three times, shut out. The, the most violent, I thought the most violent was the, when we went to uh, McDonald's, I thought that was the, the, I think that crowd really meant to hurt us. And I think what helped us was um, the owner, um, locked the door, locked us in, and turned that gas on. And that gas was awesome. But I think if we had not been locked in, the audience I saw on the outside, they really had weapons and backs, bat, and I think they would have hurt us real bad. Can you describe that moment a little bit more when he turned, I don't understand when he turned the gas on. The, uh, uh, when we were in there, the kids that was working in there, they, they left and went out, and we were still at the counter waiting to be served, and they locked the doors. Now, the gas was not the natural gas. It was, uh, what kind of gas was that? That foggy, they turn that fog gas, and it burns you, and it, oh, it gets in your eyes and shuts your breathing off. What is that gas called? Yeah, 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 it's, it's, it's kind of cake gas. Yeah. Now, what helped me with that was my brother, Troy, was in Houston. He had talked around at home about that gas because police would shoot it sometime. And, and, he, and he said, if the way you hound that is, that water helps you dilute, make sure... Grab, a, get hold some water, and if, it's, if you're in a building, uh, come over, put your head in the water, and water the towel, and, 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 and he told me that. And so when uh, they shot that gas, I went to the sink, and turned to the sink, the water was still on, and I said, everybody get in the water, and we all went in the water, and uh, well, I guess somehow we close by because the water got cut off, but we, but we was surviving pretty good. But that was, ooh, and that it would just burn, just burn you up. So it was, it was a. Who turned on the gas, police or the owner of the McDonald's? I, I guess the owner, because it, it, it was a, oh, it, they're shooting, it, 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 it shooting yeah. yeah. And, and, and when they came through the back, and sprayed and then locked down and, and, and we was in there. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that's how that came about. But uh, fortunate for us, I had heard about that and, and we had a little water that 
that calmed people down a little bit. One of the key themes in a lot of this, this, these kinds of moments, was the the tensions that that are inevitable that, that just couldn't be avoided in those moments of black mm-hmm. community. So, mm-hmm. for example, we've talked about uh, Chancellor Davis, mm-hmm. his pressures. He's trying to. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess he has his set of motives. Yeah. Typically understood to be the legislature was in session. He right. wanted to make sure that the mm-hmm. money mm-hmm. wasn't right. cut back sharply mm-hmm. for the college. Mm-hmm. Um, black clergy. The traditional NAACP elites, mm-hmm. the black business community, mm-hmm. to the extent that people have different interests and motives. And can you talk about sort of how the the uh, the black community came down on us very hard? There were two black business people that supported us. The entire black neighborhood wanted us run out of town. The um, the Mr. Brown was the funeral home guy. He was the only one. And the white population got very upset with him because he was wealthy. And, uh, and he said to us, this thing I get out of hand, but I'm going to just say this part right here. If y'all end up in jail, don't worry about it. I'll bond everybody out of jail. And that's all he said to us. That was Mr. Brown, the funeral home man. And his son, he was an older guy, and his son was about to take over. And, uh, and he said, Dad, you, you sure you want to do this? His dad said to him, Son, if you don't want to do it, get out. I'm going to do it. Then his son came back and said, I'll, I'll handle it for your dad. The other person was Dr. Dr. That was one, uh, he was a, but a dentist, a very, very well-known dentist. And of the medical community, he was the only one. And he came that evening after it was over with, and he asked, was anybody hurt? If anybody get hit in the mouth, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it at no cost. So those two were the only two business people. Now, when we went down, when you would go towards um, uh, McDonald's, there was a couple of business there. Was, there was a little club there and something else. Now, those folks told us not to walk over that side. <laughs> we had to go on the other side and with no side walk over there. And so these are black business. So no, get off the side. So that. Now, one thing that came to our rescue, I think, seal the deal, is there's this guy named Reverend Allen. He was the pastor of a large, Methodist Church. And I think Reverend Allen may have been from New York or somewhere about, you know, how the Methodist Church transferred him. And we didn't know who he was. There come this guy with this blue suit. And, um, and we was getting ready to go to, I think we were fixing to go to a Holiday Inn maybe, because that's where we got arrested, the first arrest. And this guy shows up, fair skinned the guy, nice blue suit. And we were standing at this, at this uh, Holiday Inn. And this guy walks up and says, you know, these are students here to get an education. Their parents has worked hard and gave them money to come up here to go to school. They got money to come into your place and pay for that meal. And we were all sitting there. We had no idea who this guy was. And so, and this manager, whatever, he came out and said, who are you? That's when he said, I'm, I'm Reverend Allen. Uh, the, the pastor of whatever this church. He said, yes, sir. Does the United Methodist Church know you're involved with this? He said, I ain't involved with nothing. I think these are our future. You need to get off the premises. Don't you go into jail. 
He said, if standing on the premises, just standing here and having a conversation, just take me with you. But I, I got the impression, we, go, we all got excited, but it looked like it was something about him being a Methodist kind of calmed those folks away. And then that's when he turned around and said, do y'all have a meeting get together? And, um, and Bill Hansen said, yeah. He said, my church door is open, day or night. And uh, so uh, he said, he said, well, thank you. And so we left there and went to a church and kind of talked about what may happen. This might be a going to jail thing because this guy had police standing back as if they was going to arrest us. So we went over to the church, and but we came the next day. And the next day we came, that's when them kids from towns, and, uh, the thugs want to be thugs. And they showed up, it was about six, seven of them. Whoa. So now I walked on and talked to them and said, now you know this is none about, yep, yep, we, 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 we go home with you. And then that was this really, <laughs> this guy had this, this real dark skinned guy. All these guys had nicknames. One guy was Popo, Pop, Pop Mouth, Hot Dogs, all these nicknames. It took me a long time to try to figure out the real name. And, and he was supposed to be the real bad thugs. He was fighting a minute. He said, No, told Bill Hanson and Mr. Greenwich and all them. So no, we're going in, we're going down with you on this one. He said, when it's all over with and things don't cool off, we'll get our we'll get our punches in there. I said, what you mean? He said, oh yeah, we, we know how to get back. You know, it might be six months later, well, we know how to get back. <laughs> I said, well look here, don't don't break none of that for a while. He said, oh no, we 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 going down with you. It ain't gonna be no fight, no talk back, we going with you. And uh, so they 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 are. Uh, they did that. And that was the, the first arrest. Yeah, so. Some of the um, some of the uh, I'm gonna pause it okay. real quick. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we're back on. I just didn't want to pause it get too big. Okay, okay. Some of the things happen pretty close in time that are both very significant. One is <clears throat> the first ever very modest, but the first ever successful integrations at a restaurant table in Pine Bluff, March. Mm -hmm. But also, pretty quickly, that's when the arrests are going to start. Mm -hmm. There will be a lot of people in jail by the end of March because mm -hmm. the police department switched tactics. All right. And um, as you were just saying, you know, you get to a point where you think, yeah, we might now be heading towards arrests. Mm -hmm. when, when that moment arrived, um, I wonder how you made your calculation because of what the implications of jail jails and those places in those mm -hmm. times and so forth. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that was a, a fear, a real fear moment that, that, that because you know, we had to beat and all that, but all that was outside. I think when we talked about the, the, uh, the hotel going to take us, take us down, I I think the college people in the crowd was real nervous, but them young guys, <laughs> they had been to jail, <laughs> and they were kind of like an asset, said, oh man, it, it ain't no big thing, they just, it's just going to be crowded and nasty up in there, and I said, they, so like, what y'all do? oh, we've been in there before, so what, and people started engaging a little bit. But I think that kind of calmed people's nerve a little bit. Just those younger, younger guys have been there. And then when Mr. Coleman came by, and he didn't, he, he didn't go to jail, but he was standing across the street. And I think when people looked around and saw the faces, even though it was a long distance away, kind of made you feel a little better. So we, we uh, kind of got a little support. But but what going to jail did was amazing to me is that is when 
the jail mail, that jail thing is when the old black people came out. And we was in jail, and they had a meeting at Reverend Allen Church. There wasn't no college student, and nothing like that. But I was told that church was packed. And, um, and they was talking about having a bond that's out and all that. And Mr. Brown was there, he said, no, I'll go up. And they tell me, he said, them little old ladies had low rolls of money in the bra and some had it in the, in the shoes, bringing that little money to bail us out. Uh, and I think when that church group, the, that old population, I think that shook the whole city because um, you, because after that, we saw a lot more yelling and cursing and, 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 and white people start throwing objects, but they weren't that close to us. They would be, and, yo, yo, you niggas, you niggas, and were throwing at us. That was a big chain, because at first they was in there knocking you down. And so we were saying, oh, I think that's gonna have some impact here. Because the old people didn't come out and march with us, but they would come to that church. And, and then they started thing, and uh, they started doing things like going to the jailhouse, asking people in the jailhouse, can we bring the kids some food? And, and at first they said no. And I don't know who changed that, but I know Reverend Allen and some members, and, and uh, when they brought the food down there, they let us out on this big old, you know, that, that park where when they lock you up, and they're holding that big old holding cell before they send you to the way in the back where you know little tight bars. Um, so those people brought, they let us, they actually let us eat. You know, they had all these big old fat chiefs standing there like they gonna kill somebody, but they let them bring their food in. And and, uh, and I think that calmed people because from that point on, every time we would go back, we would see a few more people coming and, and stuff like that. And then the, the one thing happened, uh, a little scary, is <clears throat> on campus, somebody had said that if we don't stop demonstrating, the football team, the sports team, we're going to lose. They're going to take all that money. I think that was a scare tactic. But man, we, uh, when we were bonded out of jail, there was a lot of girls and things from uh, Pine Bluff were coming to see us. Man, them big old football players came down there just shoving folks out of the way and threatening to bust our skull, and that was scary. Because I think some of them guys did take that serious. Yeah, y'all go back, and if I lose my skull, I'm going to kill you myself. Yeah, so that, that, that. So it that wasn't was, just no sports, it was no scholarship. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. So it, that, that was kind of scary. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty scary. There. What was the? What was the? How'd your? How'd your case ever get? What was the resolution of your legal case in a narrow legal sense? Well, the the attorney for us was what's that guy's name? Right there in Pine Bluff. Wilder Brand. No, Wilder Brand took the big stuff. Yeah. The everything. Yep. It was a. It was a. It was a young real small black guy had a law a law firm and everybody said no no he, he's, he's not gonna he's not gonna participate he really got a good law but um i think way later i think maybe bill clinton or somebody appointed him to be a, a federal judge little bit of guy and um and he walked into the church that, that's what it was a sunday afternoon church, we'd all gotten out, and it's just tons of people came, oh, we just love you. <laughs> yeah, right. And he came in there, and he just walked in and told Reverend Allen, I'll handle the case, and just left, just like that. And I'm not sure what happened to that case, because I don't remember going to court, 
I don't know if it was thrown out or what, because the big stuff uh, that my man was handling, he was the whole uh, discrimination, uh, civil rights, rights, and he had a big, just a big, a big case, yeah. And he was appealing his to the federal level. Uh, so it, it, and it kind of started calming down. And, and so we went, we went to uh, Woolworth again. And what they had done is, I guess they had told all the white people don't come in a certain time. So we went at eight. And we went back to uh, the hotel. And the guy told us it was full. And they didn't tell me, but I was told later that uh, they told some people that uh, to, keep, to keep my doors open uh, uh, and to keep me off the lawsuit and to keep white people because if the white people get mad, they're going to destroy my hotel and all that kind of stuff. He said, could you tell your people come down here after dark <laughs> at night? <laughs> so I don't know if, if that happened, but I know during that time we did go down to the, the Holiday Inn and we had a little thing and they let us use the room. I never, I, ne I never went that. To, I, I didn't go that too, uh, to to just spend the night. Mm -hmm. So it, it 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 settled a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever? <clears throat> I want to make a transition of a sort mm. towards um, <clears throat> towards what will be your decision to take a formal role with SNCC mm -hmm. and ultimately head into the Delta. Mm -hmm. And also. Um, before that, did you ever circle back around? Did you ever have any kind of closing conversation or, or meet again in some later sense with uh, Chancellor Davis? No, no, we we were banned. We couldn't even, yeah, yeah we couldn't even go on campus or nothing. No, years later, not. No, no, yeah, no. That there were that f first uh, wave of suspension. Now, there were three or four kids who were suspended and stayed with us a while. Now, they went back to school a well, year later. Apology, I think. Mm -hmm. That was his mm -hmm. condition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, I never did go back. Uh, my wife was suspended. She didn't, she didn't go back. Um, when were you married? I got married uh, May 16, 1964. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, she she wasn't in the arrest group, but she was with us when we went to um, the very first one, Woolworth, and she um, and we went. Where else did we go? Cause we was arrested in the, at, at at the hotel because she didn't she didn't get arrested, but she 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 was in the group of of that first group. My wife was, and a homegirl of hers. But uh, now she never did go back. Joanne never went back. It was about seven or eight of us stayed, stayed the course. Yeah. Let me ask about something that's going to become very, very important in the SNCC Arkansas story in a space of a few years. But in this, in this early phase, 60, spring of 63, moving mm -hmm. forward a little ways, you mentioned that you meet the woman who will become your wife. Mm -hmm. Ruth. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Hansen will meet. Mm -hmm. A woman who will become his yeah, wife out of all of this context, yeah. Ruth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so, two things I'm interested in. One is what it's like to be with other people in such relatively intense circumstances, mm -hmm. and reflect about what that. Pause for a second. Mm -hmm. We're on the road again. Okay. Mr. Jones, I want to ask about <clears throat> a couple things. Thinking about <clears throat> being together with other people doing this intense work. Mm -hmm. One is the your reflections and perspective on on being with people in such intense circumstances, the relationships, the human dynamics of that kind of experience, mm -hmm. and also the interracial aspect of that in mm -hmm. your specific circumstances there in mm -hmm. Pine Bluff and then in SNCC, Arkansas, because mm -hmm. of what will come to happen. Mm -hmm. The um, 
the involvement, the interracial involvement made everything more difficult on the white side and the black side. On, on the black side, there was a lot of growing resentment toward whites being involved because they were being perceived as, as the lead part, not, not black folks themselves. Though that was not the case, but that's what they saw, and they saw a lot of that through Bill Hansen. Um, when we would go to the um, uh, meetings, like we have meetings, mass meetings, and trying to recruit people in the neighborhood or trying to get something started, we specifically made an effort for me to lunch it because when the whites would um, try and launch it, 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 be, it would just kind of die dead, no response, and, and it always would be a thing where the black folk want to hear my answers of, of, of that. So that, that, that really stalled meetings and, and efforts to strategize real bad. On the uh, racial, on the racial side, I think um, that was a hard core resentment in the case of uh, Bill and Ruthie. Uh, an interracial marriage right there in Little Rock, I mean right there in Arkansas, that was just a no-no. And, and I think when things were getting a little quiet sometimes, when whites would see that, it would flare back up. Uh, that's what it's all about, you know. You know, it's so that was a, uh, and and then that that's really what generate the uh, what generated the, the the thinking is that we got to officially make Jim Jones the head of this to get rid of that because that just too much of a too much because when we would. When we would go to protest, it was so much focus on the whites, you really couldn't get kind of through to talk about what we're trying to do. Because uh, their attitude was, what's with the white boys? They, they don't need to go, there ain't no problem with them going to a holiday in the state. They just here to make trouble. That, that's how they perceived it. So that made it a, a more difficult. And when I took charge of it. I told Bill, you stay at the office and coordinate some stuff. Let, 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 let us run this thing. And, and that made it, the crowd was a lot more, com more comfortable. And I think we were growing in numbers when, 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 when that move was made as well. When you needed to shift into these <clears throat> more prominent, consistently prominent roles, because obviously there's plenty mm -hmm. of prominent roles all the way along, but, um, and the, and the, project director title shifted to you, mm -hmm. 64. How did Hanson, and w were there implications for your relationship, your working relationship, your personal relationship? How'd that go up? No, no, that, that, that stayed pretty good. But, uh, but um, Hanson was a very aggressive, very aggressive person. And we, and I had to really shut him down a lot of time in situation. I said, now, there are some places we need to target like the voter registration stuff. And, and I made a specific point, Forest City, you know, Helena, West Helena, um, Mariana, those, those are hardcore conservative hate area because all that part of Arkansas is where all them big plantation was. And, and I said, and we got to be careful because I think there are some of them, um, as we call them, them good old boys. Uh, see me and you, I think uh, the shot gonna be fired at you. And um, he didn't want to do none of that, but 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 me and and Greenwich and all of us are now. I'm 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 going. You know, there comes a time when 
you know, we planted the seed and, and, and got thing going, you know, and we got a little, little group together, that's okay. But for you to come out, you know, in, in a league capacity over there, that's too dangerous. You, you're endangering too many people. Uh, and, and he was, he was very, um, he, he didn't want to do that because um, uh, though he didn't say it, Nell would admit it, he liked that lamb light. <laughs> he liked it. <laughs> he liked it, but he, he swayed it. Yes, you do. You love reading your name. You love getting hit in the head. <laughs> and then run up to a camera and show, show the blood on you. That ain't, that ain't what it's about. And I knew when we went to those places, they were going to respond to the color of my skin. Because it, it was all the whites who they knew in the, those neighborhoods were folk they didn't like. And you, we don't need you to add to it. And, and when we, uh, now, and when I got the first place I went was uh, Forest City. Now that Forest City surprisingly responded kind of quickly. And I think it had to do with uh, uh, Miss Clay. She owned a funeral home and she, and she had a big old house and she said, y'all come and take that house, you can stay there. And then she had a, a sister, a cousin who was a principal and, and, and I think she had that the professional folks in, in, you know, uh, around her. And, and when we went, and when we went to her house and she called them all over there and we told them what, I said, no, we ain't trying to integrate uh, something here in Forest City. But it's such a huge base. That part of Arkansas is 90% black. And the voting over here is zero. And, and so I think that issue was a little easier than cracking the, the, the restaurants and, and going to the jail. But uh, no, 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 there were, there were some issues there. And, and I think the issue had to do with uh, uh, Bill didn't want to relinquish his role. Uh, but we, we kind of got through it, but th that was, we had to get tough with him. Now, stay here. You know, just, uh, we had to do it that way. Yeah. 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 I want to ask more about the voting work and registration work and, and other parts mm -hmm. of the program in the Delta. But let me first ask, how did you, did you go to Atlanta occasionally? Did folks come from Atlanta, from SNCC to, how how the relationship with the national folks work out? Most of the, most of us was, uh, I would take trips down there and, and they would have those we call uh, coordinating uh, meeting. And that's where all the different states that was involved had all these SNCC people. We would come there and, and we would exchange thoughts and ideas. What are you doing here? How did how you overcome that? And, 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 and a lot of that. So I got a good feel, good feel for it. But uh, one of the things that I felt differently about was I thought I had a better feel for people in Arkansas, and I, because I had a farm background, a lot of the folks back in those days somewhere were farm connected. And when I got to Atlanta and would go down there, all them boys were big city boys. And they would just be sitting up articulating and, 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 and uh, in order to say we're going to go uh, or down the road to a store. It'd take them three hours to get because they, they had these educated kids and they was articulating what they know and all the big words. I'd just be sitting there and say, what are, what, what are y'all doing? It, it was, I saw a lot of showing off their education and not a good feel for the neighborhood. That, that never was part of it. And when they, uh, and then when they were asked, mean to make comments, well, I would talk very specific about the level of folks I'm dealing with and what the issue is that, and, and then I don't think that's going to happen until blah, 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 blah. And so old Jim Foreman told me one time, he said, he said, Joan, 
what you are doing is a di real direct connection to the community. But that, that's a wonderful thing. And he said, and he asked me, he said, do you want, uh, do you want us to send some people? I said, well, not really, but I'll tell you what I would like to do. There is, you got a group down there, that's a great singing group. Send that group up here and, and to one of those meetings I have, because I have a lot of people, and they church folks, they'll love that. And I said, and, and, and let's slowly graduate. But those guys, you know, when they came and saw that big crowd, all they want to do was sing, have a good time, and went on back. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but what I was doing was uh, asking people to uh, uh, put your shoes on and let's go knock on some doors and, and try to get people to vote. And, and then I said, also, uh, I told Miss Clay, Miss Clay, we need some, a couple of folks to run for something, but they need to be educated, they need to be highly respected. And then she told me that um, this guy that was, they had a little uh, plan in Forest City, I think it may have been a comment factor. He said, well, that guy over there, he, he'd been promoted to manager. I said, let's run him. And, and we did. And, but it, it wasn't like the mayor, none, but it, it was a, a position, and he won. And, and folks said, I never thought I, it was going to happen. I said, well, you, you do have to make an effort to make it happen. And he went on and did real well. And I said, and that's, what, that's the kind of stuff we need to do as well as, um, I said, you know, we don't have to, we don't have to go into a, a white restaurant to eat. <laughs> so when you, if somebody do want to do that, you know, uh, they can, you know. So. Uh, so that, 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 that's, that's the direction I, I went. Uh, yeah. uh, I mean, the SNCC program seemed to have those three big thrusts. <clears throat> Public accommodations, mm -hmm. where you could do that. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the whole voter registration mm -hmm. and, and starting to run people in mm -hmm. electoral campaigns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, education, too. You were mm -hmm. talking about the schools question, too. Mm -hmm. um, the, I've read that, the, I've seen the numbers for what the SNCC program accomplished in short order, I mean, in mm -hmm. pretty darn short order. Oh, yeah. 24 mm -hmm. months, mm -hmm. less than that, and mm -hmm. kind of what yeah. number yeah. you're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, more people signing up, despite the poll tax still mm -hmm. persisting. Mm -hmm. A lot of candidates get into races. Right, exactly. There's the 66 governor's race outcome, which is mm -hmm. a curious thing mm -hmm. because of the black vote. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And, um... Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're rolling. Okay, we're, yeah. back. <clears throat> we're back on after a, a short break for equipment. Uh, uh, Ms. Jones, we were we were starting to talk about the, the program, the mm -hmm. program, the work out there, and, and the voting mm -hmm. work, getting people into races. Mm -hmm. And let me just turn it over to you. Mm -hmm. Now, in some cases, folks fell short in vision because there were individuals who public accommodation was all they had in their head. And you know, once you integrate or, or desegregate, and all the restaurants has opened their doors, and you can go in the uh, uh, go in the town and get your room, to me that's that's finished. But we had some folks who, you know, look long distance. Well, let's go, let's go to Chicago and protest. <laughs> That's an example, of, because that was the only spoke they had, and 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 those are the folks. Uh, us, well, in in Arkansas, I said no, you know, no that that we we need to, this population need to, you know, access voting and and start running candidates, you know, and that was a new new piece to it, uh, but some folks were were stuck. I mean, they were stuck and couldn't get off that. Yeah. yeah. So, you describe a, the, the, your experience across a, 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 a representative week doing voter registration work in the Delta, fall of mm -hmm. 63, 60, early 64. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. happens to you in that week, and who do you see, and what's it like, and how does it feel? When my approach to it is in every community, almost every community, there is that woman, and in most cases it, it was women, 
And uh, I learned that from, that lady name was Dearworth and Goo, Miss Dearworth. And she said, young man, when you go into a neighborhood, um, for the first time, if there's a black barber shop there, go in there. I said, okay. And you ask for a Pacific type people. I'm looking for somebody that um, is interested in politics or know some good people that could run for office or they have a lot of influence. She said, those gossiping men in the barbershop know that stuff. So when I went to Forest City, I, I took that advice. And, uh, and uh, I pulled up and there was a, about four or five guys out there. You know, I think these working people on a break. And I said, I um, introduced myself, and, and I didn't say I was SNCC. I said, I'm part of a program, and we're trying to encourage uh, black folks to vote more. And, and, and even better than that, we would like to see more black folks run for office. And when I said that, the first thing came, it was like all three of them said the same thing, you need to go talk to Mrs. Clay. I said, now who is Mrs. Clay? She owns a funeral home. Her husband died, but she, she, she made an even bigger funeral home. She, that's who you need to talk to. And uh, so I had my little Volkswagen. I said, well, how do I get that? Well, come on, I, follow me. They went around. I mean, they like actually introduced me to her. And she was ready, she was ready to go. She said, young man, I'm just glad to see you. It's long overdue. She was all excited. And uh, she said, I told my sister, I said, what's your sister? She said, she's a principal over there. And just the two of us talk all the time. She go on that phone and dial up. And, uh, and she said, how you want to do that? I said, it, uh, I said first of all, uh, I need a place to stay. I probably need to stay two or three days. She said, see that house right there? See that house right there? See that house right there? I said, yeah, all of my house. Which one you want? <laughs> I said, I just need someone to sleep. <laughs> And uh, man, she went there and fixed and picked me up, and her sister came over, and she said, told me about this preacher. He said, he's a very aggressive preacher, but he's by himself. Went over there, and I said, well, we need to have a meeting. And those two women said, we'll do the calling. You just go on over there. I don't know who all they called, but they had a church packed that night. And then that's when this guy's name came up. He was there. He said, you know everybody, and th th all the working folks here, if all of them just vote for him, he got to win. <laughs> and that's how that got started. So that, that seed was there, but it was just sitting still, you know. And, th and then that's when I started. Uh, I, said, I, 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 I made a point to go back there later on. I said, I followed your advice. She said, in every community, every that type of person. And then when I went to other places, you know, I was looking for that type. And I got to West Helena, that little lady over there, I can't think of any names anymore. She had a, she had a store, her little store. And I walked up to her and introduced myself and I said that I, what I was doing and I'm trying to encourage people to vote and, and we are running for candidate. She said, I ran two years ago, but I didn't have no vote because Miss Folks, she said, I love to work with you. And she said, Park your car. We took off. <laughs> so I don't know if she said, Well, I'm, I'm getting kind of old now, but uh, my son just finished college down at Pine Bluff. And uh, I'm not talking to him about running. But she was able to rally those type meetings. And a few years later, after I'd gone, I learned there's a lot more elected folks started, you know, that, that, caught, that caught on and, and, and took off. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'm so, uh, at, at, by then, when I, I went back through there and learned some things, and, and, I, and I met a, I met a, what's this guy? He's, he's an attorney in Little Rock. What's his name? I chatted with him. And he said, yeah, some good things have been going down. He, he worked with uh, 
they had a health clinic in Mariana. And uh, Bill Clinton appointed him, I understand, as a, a federal judge. What's that guy's name? Oh, shit, shit. Uh, it, it'll come to me. And, and he said, that, oh, there's, there's a lot of good things that's gone on in East Austin, I mean, East uh, uh, Arkansas. And, and then that's where I, I stayed in that circle until I left, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I didn't want to just be accommodation because I thought we had gotten past that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Before we turn to some of the reasons that, that you departed in 65, uh, moved to Atlanta, um, what was your mood? What was your sense of relative gains, challenges mm -hmm. not met? How, how were you feeling about your work out there in those, after, from fall 63 on? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I felt good because uh, uh, I have a personality of incredible tolerance. And when I go out to do things and folks don't participate or we don't get it done, I don't get disgusted. I don't get mad. I just say to myself, well, we can't win them all. And, and I'm, I've, I've always been that type of person. But I also learn is uh, um, my personality has helped me a lot. You know, I don't get mad with folks. I don't pick and choose and I can take it. You dog me, talk about me, it doesn't bother me at all. And so I don't see it as a failure. You know, sometimes I said, you know, I, I, I wish we could have done or could have gotten a bigger role of folks participating, but it doesn't bother me uh, uh, that it didn't. And, and, and I'm real, I'm very realistic about things. Um, I have never put my eyes on, when I look at doing things, I work at it hard and very diligent. But if it's, if 15 people step up and, and really work at getting it done, some folks, uh, it's just like in church, some folks, um, you can get a lot done, but some folks think if you can't get 75 people to help you, it's a failure. I said, no, 75, 75 people will be a problem for you. So let's get a small group that's, that, that's got high energy and ready to go. And, and that's where I've, I've always worked. And, and I think uh, because I've, uh, I was, uh, could recruit people and identify, folks took off and, and did a lot of things. I, I remember I was in uh, Georgia, um, and I went to... Uh, a, a little, t uh, what was that town called? And and I went down to this little town, and and this this was uh, Were you out, there? yeah, Were you well, work on the sharecroppers thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I went I went to this little town, and and there was a little town where they they had a little factory, and it left town, and everybody unemployed. And so when I got there, I said, well, <clears throat> I went and met with this school teacher. She's a very prominent woman in the neighborhood. And I said, well, I'd like to have a little meeting. She said, I can get the people to come out. And, and when they all came out <laughs> to the meeting, it was a big meeting. There was this big warehouse sitting there. I said, wow, it's a big warehouse, and it was shut down. So I said, well, what would, uh, what, what, any thoughts about what you would like to do? Everybody in, the, in this building had these big thoughts of, uh, like building a center fire storage, uh, high-rise building, just all kind of wild stuff. And I said, can I make a, a comment on something I see with my eyes? Uh, he said, yes, go ahead. I said, if a plant comes here 
and y'all get a chance to go to work. I said, I see so many babies, so many kids, I don't think nobody in this room could go to work. And so they all started laughing. They said, Mr. Joe, you're right. <laughs> you got that. For you to go to work, you got to have someone to leave. You got five or six kids. I said, one thing I would suggest is y'all need to consider a nursery to keep kids. I be mean, that tower was saturated with little kids. I think everybody had five kids, six, ten. And this lady said, my brother, in that big warehouse, that was her brother's warehouse, she said, my brother got a big warehouse. And she said, he is such a hustler. He ain't gonna let you have that. I said, what, what kind of hustler? He, she said, he's a big time gambler. And he loved money, he ain't gonna do nothing. So I said, let me, I'd like to uh, meet him. She said, I'd call him. So he came to the meeting, 55 year old kind of guy, maybe 60. I said, sir, in order for this town to even think about going to work, because there's other works in the little town, but they couldn't go to work, nobody to take care of it. I said, we, if we could build a nursing home here for these kids to be taken care of, I think a lot of these, most of these women here could find work. He said, you think so? I said, I think so. Cause see, I'd already talked to this, 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 uh, uh, this um, big uh, army, army uh, uh, Robert some place. It's a big, big, big military. They were hiring a lot of people and, and uh, it was common labor. Mm -hmm. So I said, and that's your warehouse? He said, yeah. He said, I said, that big warehouse could be turned into, I said, what you gonna do with it? He said, I own it, I don't do nothing with it. I said, we could turn that big warehouse into uh, one heck of a nursery, and these folk would have a place to keep these kids, and they could go to work. He said, well, Mr. Jones, if you could get, get, that, get, that, get it renewed and it need a lot of work on it, I'll give it to the group. I said, I'll give it to the group. That's what he said. I said, ladies, we got, we got work to do. They said, what we got to do? I said, me and all of y'all going over there, we got to tear that whole house out, tear all that wall down, and we got to put all that board out there on the street, and we got to call the, 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 the city to tell them to come pick it up. And I said, y'all ready to do that? You gonna make us do that? Yes, ma'am. All of you, every woman in town. They showed up. And the thing that was so beautiful about this, when the, there's a big lumber company in this next town. And this guy had taken some lumber somewhere and he came by and all these women, bow, bow. And that guy, he said, come here, sir. You, uh, you, I, you the only man I see. What, are you in charge of this? I said, yes, sir. I told the women, we want to tear down this place, rip it on the inside, we got to turn it into a, a nursery so all these women with all these babies can go to work. That guy said, down there at the, uh, he, he said, he repeated, he said, down there at the, at the, um, at the, what, some robber, some robber, but it's a big, uh, 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 Navy, yeah. mm -hmm. Navy base or something like that. He said, man, they would love to have these women coming in because they, they way short. He said, you got no money to pay? I said, no. Mm -mm. We it's just sweat and blood. He said, let me go talk to my boss. 
one of Roberts. That's, that's the name of the play. Yeah, that's the name of the play. This uh, this guy went down there, and it's about five or thirty. Came back. He he said, "You know what? I got some good news." He said, "If them women got to do all that building." He told him, said, all that lump out there, he says, been a little rain on, but it's still good. You just, you take it up there. Man, them women built that thing, and, th and the guy who owned it, he came up there, he said, man, are you God sent? Or you ain't Jesus Christ, are you? <laughs> man, how'd you get to women to do all that work? <laughs> That's what they're doing it for themselves. And we got this. You, man, that thing, that thing was about two blocks, three blocks inside. And so this one lady said, can't you get federal money? I said, let me tell you about that. No, you don't want that. If we get federal money for this, the federal government make you put square feet per child. You won't get a third of them kids in that bill. But if you private like you are, you own it, you can stack them in like, like sardines. <laughs> And all of y'all that's not working, don't get a job, you come down here and y'all become the group that take care of all these babies. And all y'all that get a job, y'all start giving them a few dollars for taking care of these kids. Just like that, man, that thing just took off. Just took off. And, uh, and long after I left, I would get little cars from folks saying, it, it went so well. And, and we would love to see you come back and visit. But that's, that's been years ago. Right. You know, and it's always just, you know, I've just kind of been a little gifted on that side, mm -hmm. just seeing things and just, and, sure. and believe that folk can, can do it pretty good themselves, you know, so. Let, let's talk a little bit as we kind of move yeah. towards our, our last section of the interview. Mm -hmm. um, to talk about some of the reasons, some of the things that were happening in SNCC mm -hmm. nationally, how they mm -hmm. reverberated in Arkansas, some of the things mm -hmm. happened in Arkansas and then how you made your transition over. Mm -hmm. um, we talked earlier about in 64, the directorship passes formally mm -hmm. into your hands. You mm -hmm. talked about Bill Hansen. Mm -hmm. There were other whites that had come in and mm -hmm. were coming in in that time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, I think the SNF, <coughs> excuse me, the SNCC staff, 64, 65-ish in Arkansas, mm -hmm. would have been about eight people mm -hmm. full time, so mm -hmm. uh, full staffers and mm -hmm. uh, four black, four white. Mm -hmm. Um, the tensions are becoming a little more closely felt mm -hmm. on the racial leadership of the organization mm -hmm. question. 65 is a pretty hot summer nationally, first riots and all. Mm -hmm. The whole question of the integrationist model is now being mm -hmm. challenged by lots of folks. Mm -hmm. Things aren't, especially, you know, we've talked about the economic difficulties of moving on the economic front. It's just getting. You know, like like you said earlier, some people's vision went to public accommodation. Mm -hmm. But after you desegregate, what mm -hmm. then? How do you finally get your economic mm -hmm. justice issue underlined mm -hmm. all the time? Mm -hmm. So with all that as kind of prelude, I'm interested in your perspective on through that 64, 65 period, how those questions played out inside your life mm -hmm. in SNCC in Arkansas, and how you the circumstances that led to your move to mm -hmm. move away. Well, you know, my moving away and is was um, what I saw and what I felt was the resources and the use of people was uh, dwindling, and a, a a lot of the folks who had that energy early was beginning to drift toward going to work to make a living. People were getting older, the SNCC group was young and high energy and educated and, and this whole movement was a fun thing. And a lot of folks was not recognizing we're getting older, we're becoming family folks, resources are dwindling and that was a natural thing to me. But a lot of the white kids who've come down wanted that to be a lifetime situation. 
but this, what we were dealing with was not lifetime. Uh, a lot of the kids that we had worked with and we saw do wonderful things and SNCC and all of that, they, they too had hit college level and gone on. And when me and my wife and I said this to, to Bill Hansen, all the members, look guys, this, this, we have done a pretty good job and we are going to ruin it if we keep stretching it and stretching it and we ain't doing nothing. There's no means of income and, and what, and, and then that's, and that's when uh, folks start peeling off because I think the the Black Panthers and, and, and the Stokely and all that, they saw that movement drilling too. And they were trying to rebuild them some little new new uh, new things and, and get it going since this has kind of ended. And then I think to me, I think SNCC sort of uh, went as far as its capabilities. And we had to recognize that we got older and needed job to support families. And, and we had seen uh, black elected officials come in, and I thought that was, that was very successful. But there were a lot of folks, and you know, there's still, uh, uh, still people who think we still should be doing that. No, it, it, uh, uh, it, it, it's not the same that it's changed, people have changed. Now, yeah, the condi there are conditions all around, but it does not fit, I don't think it fit a snick or snick type of activity that we were doing. I think we did pretty good fueling folks growth, but uh, I don't think we could, could be a lifetime instrument for that, yeah. You were in Atlanta, but, um, and busy, I'm sure, traveling quite a bit for a sugar mm -hmm. cup respond, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but 66 in the spring, obviously, John Lewis is ousted at SNCC and mm -hmm. sort of Fire Michael comes in. And uh, mm -hmm. one last thing I want to ask about kind of what's, or maybe two things left behind or, or things that will happen in Arkansas while you're now on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. um, one is um, Greenwich is, feels compelled to basically make a statement <coughs> challenging the abandonment of the integrationist model. Mm -hmm. And Stokely Carmichael actually comes to, mm -hmm. comes to Arkansas. Mm -hmm. and has things to say about Greenwich and that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm interested in if you had a, at the time, you were a long ways away, and I don't know mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. kind of watched that at that time. That's one thing. The, the other thing is um, uh, the emergence in Arkansas, in Little Rock anyway, mm -hmm. of Bobby Brown and the Black Youth United, and mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. you bumped up against that at all? Mm -hmm. in those I, I didn't, that, you know, uh, I'll bump into it, but you know, I, I, I heard about it and knew what was taking place. I think uh, the way I perceived that was that was going to be a very small faction and it was going to be very satisfying to Brown and it was going to be very satisfying to Stokely. But I don't think they were focusing on anything that was going to be helpful to people. They were on their one-way trip and they were egoing on it and both of those guys always way back in the early days of SNCC wanted to be the top gun but they didn't have an audience and that's what that is and that's nothing else. You know, um, I remember a long time ago uh, Stokely was trying to carve out him a group because he wanted to be the next Malcolm X. And that's all that was. He wasn't focused on benefits or trying to make situation better and different. He just wanted that, you know, that, that, that star in his, his hat. And, and I never was interested in, in, in that, you know. I think you have to sort of try to make a difference the best you can, but to 
go out there on your own and and carve you out a little spot. I think that's to me that's a waste of time, and it's not going anywhere. You know, it gets you a lot of media and all that kind of stuff, but it's, it's nothing. It's, it's nothing else. I don't think. No, I, I I was in tune and knew about all that, but none of that was anything I. When I was uh, with the sharecroppers, one of the things that uh, I de had to deal with is that that was small farmer stuff. You always had guys who wanted to go attack the white man, attack FHA, and and take their money and and just just. Go find all the black farmers and just throw all the money out there to them. I said, well, guys, that's wasteful thinking. Excuse us. I'm sorry. If they don't do it, you know. <laughs> you know I'll, I'll throw that too unreal. John, should we jump back on here? Yeah, we're on. Okay. okay. All right. We're on now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me ask about a couple things here as we as we wind down. Um, you, you, you want to tell important story about the tensions inside, say, the, your, your work at sharecroppers, but I mean, people have different ideas about how to go at these problems. Mm -hmm. With the sharecroppers, there are folks who feel they deserve being paid a lot of money. No identification of what for, but just to do it. What my assignment was at sharecroppers was to go identify in Virginia, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, small farmers. And I did not deal with the inside of that mechanism. I told them I think there are some opportunities for them to sell their product and make some money. That's the end I worked on. And I worked with uh, national chain stores and, and the big chain stores. And I learned in that circle, most of the stores was looking for black farmers, small farmers, product. Closer, fresher, a lot cheaper because of the distance. And that worked fine. That was kind of easy. <laughs> but what had some of them blocked is they were talking about the uh, money the big farmers were making, which was not always true, and shipping it all over the country, and you, you need a lot of volume. And they w weren't looking over the fact that I got five acres of tomatoes that I can harvest four times, and I can send it right here to Crocus, and Crocus will buy it, which is an excellent marketing strategy. They were looking past that, and that's the kind of stuff I work with, and then they dealt well. Now, what, some of them ended, but that was because the older population who was farming, children didn't want to farm and headed to New York. Well, it's time to close that project down. And some folks don't, don't recognize that. And you have to be straight with them. So no, you, you have nobody to run the farm anymore. Don't sell your property. Please don't sell it because in five or 10 years, right here is probably gonna be the home of condos. So you make plenty of money selling it. So that, that, that's the side I've worked on, yeah. trying to get them to make money. Yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned earlier on that talking about yourself and how you could go through this experience. You said you're a realist. You have a kind of a measured sense of mm -hmm. outcomes. And uh, being a realist, did you ever have reason to think that, you know, looked at in some ways, the progress is much slower than we all would like on you know, some of the basic economic questions. Mm -hmm. That maybe the, maybe there's another way to do this. Maybe, maybe with institutional racism, those kinds of built-in mm -hmm. headways that uh, maybe the integrationist model we had in mind isn't quite mm -hmm. the right model. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just any second? No, I, I uh, my thinking 
was in the mall. I never did see it like a lot of the guys did that uh, the integration thing was, was, uh, was the mall to go with. What I did see though is a lot of the, the white kids who came in and played roles, I would look very closely at, some of them did have very, very good contacts. Parents in big circle, uh, wealthy. And what I, what I uh, zeroed in on, give us some contacts in the Northeast, uh, Ohio, where we can possibly um, uh, do some things, uh, do some thing. Because some of the folks in the movement saw when the, the whites came in, they uh, thought they saw money and money to be brought and put in the pot. I didn't. I always saw them as potential great contacts to make better outlets. Um, for an example, I, um, uh, in Arkansas, uh, one different kids, I said, look, we got some, we got these kids pretty smart. Uh, why don't you, like we had some kids from Boston and New York and DC, why don't we go to these kids that's pretty smart and looking to college, do you in your circle have contact with schools that we might can get scholarship? That's how I, I, I use them. I never had this dream to heaven like a lot of people did. Uh, and I think it, I think my, my background helped me to stay grounded. You know, my, my, uh, my parents did well in farming, but I saw the grind in it. And I, you know, so we didn't have this big, <laughs> this is a big trillion dollar, trillion dollar falling out of the sky. And, but I think that helped me ground. And I think some of the uh, movement people didn't have that kind of, kind of grounded background, and a lot of that stuff was theory. You know, we should be able to do that. We should be able, and and sometimes those theories were dependent on the government doing a whole lot of stuff. And 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 but the folks you were working with weren't ready for that at that, that level of stuff. So that, that's how I, and and I think uh, in terms of slow things, yeah, I, I saw slow development. I saw a lot of things didn't happen. I, I saw things like um, efforts to try and get um, more nurses and blacks in nursing, smaller hospitals in smaller towns and trying to recruit doctors to come in and, and in those areas and spend time. That didn't happen. I was hoping that kind of stuff would, would, would have made huge dents because you take uh, East, East um, Arkansas and you're looking at folk going all the way to Little Rock or to Memphis, to the big cities. And, and, and I looked at that, but that, that didn't fly. But when it didn't fly, it wasn't something that brought me down, you know. It, uh, so. Final thoughts. I, I guess uh, my final thought is my being involved with SNCC was a wonderful thing. I saw a lot of growth in people. I saw a lot of growth in young folks who excelled and went on. Uh, I think some people see that because they did well and moved on was disappointment as opposed to staying where they were and all that, just that geographical change and, and can't blame people for that. I felt, I feel real good years later that I did pretty good <clears throat> with putting people together and with, on the marketing end and small farmers. Uh, <clears throat> I think I uh, feel good about when I left, when I left SNCC, I stayed in in the rural kind of uh, area, <clears throat> still working 
on the behalf of people. Uh, and if you look at my resume, every job I've had put me in touch with working with a lot of people, and that's been the joy of my life. Just, just loved it. Don't, 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 don't. <clears throat> Probably could have been several other things. I, I wish the 50,000 black farmers we had identified in the east and the south and the far south could have been um, given some payment toward the, uh, the government not allowing them to borrow money and all of that. Uh, but a lot of those folks, when a decision was made to recognize them, 95% of those folks was dead and gone. And that level is who should have been a beneficiary. And now the sons and the daughters of those folks are in Chicago and Detroit and everywhere else. Um, and if there is a, 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 a little bit of a comment by uh, uh, compensation given, it needs to be very carefully done. I would not be real excited about John Doe in Chicago now is 37 years old and does not even know who his granddaddy was at farm 75 years ago. I, I, I don't think you know that that compensate who did the hard work. And but but I, but I, but I've been very pleased with uh, the direction I went in life. Uh, I've all I've pretty much been close to agriculture, small town, and that, that all my life, is, which is what I love doing. Yeah, so. Ms. Jones, it's, it's really been an honor yeah. and a great, great privilege. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Glad you came by. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really, really nice. yeah, 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 yeah. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.